everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Performance Cafe. And today I've got a really special guest with me, and that is Ethan King. Ethan King, I recently met at some training that we are both attending. And wow, it was just fabulous to meet him and learn from him and uh, all of his experiences. Um, you see, through his keynotes and programs, Ethan shares actionable lessons learned along his journey from a starving artist to a CEO of multiple seven-figure brands and his transformation from a flabby dad to the, co to the cover of Best Self magazine. And I just love that transformation. I love the transformation twice over. And this man has got more resilience than most. Ethan, how are you this afternoon? Hey, Innocent, I'm great. How are you doing? So great to be here. I'm Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, actually, I should ask you, how are you this morning? All right. <laughs> yes, I am in Atlanta, Georgia, and it is morning, and um, it's, it's a nice, beautiful day outside, though, so I'm, I'm happy. Awesome. So, Ethan, tell us. Uh, tell us about these transformations. What happened? What drove you? And maybe give us a, a learning from one of them. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I started out as an artist when I was young. I wanted to draw and paint for a career and uh, coming from a very practical household. My parents, I mean, my mom's a doctor, uh, my dad's a, a preacher. And they said, you know, artists don't make any money until after they're dead. So that that just really stuck with me and drove me because I wanted to make money. Like just transparently, I wanted to be very successful uh, financially, but I also wanted to, to, to do it through my art. Um, turns out my parents were right. It's very tough to make a lot of money as a traditional fine artist. There are some exceptions, but it's, it's kind of tough. So I found myself, um, I, I did, I was a hard hit kid. And I did end up majoring in art when I went to college, uh, much to my parents' dismay. Um, but because of my, uh, I'll say a misguided pursuit of wealth, I ended up getting in a lot of trouble when I was a teenager. Um, in fact, not to go too deep into this, but you know, tw before when I was 19 years old, I remember I had, I had been arrested and was in a jail cell twice. And I actually got kicked out of college for one semester due to disciplinary problems. Um, and in fact, the president of the college, and th this is a big major institution in the United States, the president of the college summoned me to his office and told me that he was suspending me and that he was showing me mercy by not expelling me from school for the trouble I was getting in. So after graduating, I didn't have a good job. I had a bit of a criminal record. Um, so I was working these odd jobs. And one of the worst ones was I was working at this um, strip club, taking out the trash and cleaning up the bar. And it was just the most, uh, it was just a very grimy, dangerous part of the city where I was working. Um, but I, I needed to work nights because in the daytime, I went back to school and learned graphic design. And, um, you know, long story short, I felt a lot of guilt about it. And one day on my way to the club, I got robbed. I got carjacked at gunpoint. And that was a moment, like an epiphany where I just turned my life around. I was like, this is not what God has planned for me. And I need to take a different route. And I left that whole industry alone. And I pursued my career as a graphic designer. And doors really just started opening up because what you focus on expands. So I got some celebrity clients, graphic design. I ended up starting a business with my girlfriend, who's now my wife of 18 years. Um, we're one of the leading producers of fraternity and sorority apparel in the United States. It's, it's called StuffForGreeks.com. Then we opened retail stores called Zeus's Closet. Uh, we now have two, have two brick and mortar locations. We have several e-commerce sites. And um, just to kind of wrap this whole transformation thing up, there was a moment where I knew that I was finally on the right path and that I had become someone else. One time we won this business award through our college alumni. It's called the Bulldog 100. And it's the it celebrates the 100 fastest growing companies that are owned by University of Georgia alumni. So we've made this list four times now. But the first time we made the list, 
there's this big banquet and we get caught up on stage to get our award. And the person who presented me with the award was the same president that had kicked me out of college 10 years earlier. And I, I had this photo with him uh, taking, taking this, get it, receiving this award. And I, I'm not sure if he even remembers who I was, but I remember that moment. And th to me, that was a moment of coming full circle and mm. becoming a new person from who I was back then. Mm. That, is, that is a phenomenal story and the resilience you must have shown. Because I mean, it's one thing to decide to change your life. It's a totally different thing to, to make it happen. So, so Ethan, a question we didn't prep. You see, yeah, I go already. Let me just put this off because it is making noises. Um, I want to ask you about you and your wife. Sorry, I don't know why people are all of a sudden speaking to me. I just this off. Apologies. No worries. Why they ignore me the whole day until I'm in a recording, then they go on. <laughs> so it's so interesting. How do you find working with your wife? I mean, you know, it's not really the more traditional model we're used to anymore. Right. Yeah, I get this question a lot. We both get this question a lot. And you know, to be honest, Innocent, I really think that being business partners, growing a business from the ground up together is what has saved our marriage and kept it strong over the years. Um, most people think, well, how, I couldn't work with my spouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'd be together if we didn't work together because I have this philosophy that a couple will last longer, will endure all of the things that life throws at you if you are side by side with a shared vision, looking together at the horizon mm -hmm. and you have a shared mission, a, a shared vision of things that you want to accomplish for your legacy, for your family, um, that you want for your life, you want freedom, you want experiences. And we are constantly working on this together. Now, if we were just staring into each other's eyes <laughs> and in love and not having a shared vision, well, that, that is not as sustainable. And that's what most people try to do. And, um, you know, it's, it's better. There's something I learned very recently I want to share with you is, and I hope we have time to go into this, but there, there are four core human needs. Um, that, and Tony Robbins mm -hmm. teaches this. A lot of the, the big teachers teach us that we need certainty. We need variety. Mm -hmm. We need love and connection. And we need significance. Mm -hmm. Those are the four core human needs. And the thing is, and we, and we, different levels of that are important to different people. Like if you're, if some people, certainty is more important. Like I want to I do the exact same thing every single day and I want to be certain I'm getting a paycheck. Um, that's important, significant, but we all also have a desire for love and connection. So the thing about these four core human needs is when three of them are met, you get addicted to something. When three of those core human needs are met, that is where addiction happens. And addiction can be good or bad. I mean, it doesn't matter about good or bad. It's, it's just what it is. So in a relationship, if, um, you know, when it starts out and you get married and you're, you have this newlywed, you know, bliss, right? Um, mm -hmm. You have certainty, you know, your partner's going to be there for you. Uh, you have the variety, variety because you are going on all these new experiences. Life is new. Maybe you're going on adventures together. Um, you have the significance because you would adore each other and you have the love and connection. So you really have all four when you're in a newlywed relationship. But what happens over time? Um, well, think maybe you have kids and things kind of you don't spend as much time together. Maybe the variety gets boring. You're with the same person. So that that area kind of wades away. Um wanes away. And then the significance, we tend to take people for granted the longer we're, we're with them. It's just human nature. So you, neither spouse feels like they're significant anymore in the relationship. And then the love and connection, maybe that gets kind of stale. But now you see that two of them have kind of faded away so that addiction starts to wear off. And this is when problems can come in the relationship. This is when extramarital stuff can happen. It's why it happens, because you are fulfilling that Core human need from somewhere else. So being aware of that, um, you know, I don't, I don't have time to like solve everyone's marital problems. I know that's not what we're here to talk about today, but just being aware of that and working together actually creates an addiction because my wife and I, 
we have the certainty, you know, we, we have a business together. That's our livelihood. It's not a side hustle. It's our main income for our family. So we want to make sure that it thrives so we can provide the life that we want to provide for our children. So we have to drive for that certainty. We also have variety. As you know, in business, you never know what things it's are going to get. Happen. There's always something new, right? But it keeps it exciting. And we feel like we have significance. You know, we're, we're always pushing to go to the next level. And it feels great to get rewarded and to uh, be recognized for your business achievements, or to, to be on a magazine cover. I never knew thought that would happen, but um, it, it feels great. It feels significant. And so, that, so those three core needs are met for us. And of course, we have the love and connection. Um, and, and then, you know, that part, we have more of a... Um, a friendship and it was established on friendship we were friends before we we have the foundation of being business partners so our love is stronger than just a, a romantic love so that's the key to me to working on working with your spouse i think that it actually strengthens a marriage but the key is you have to stay in your lane like we're very much um, my wife is her background is in insurance and she worked in corporate America for eight years. So she handles more of the payroll, the HR. Mm -hmm. I like, I cannot stand that stuff. I hate that we have to do it, uh, but it's a necessary part of business. And I've already told you my background is in the arts. I'm more of the creative part. I'm more into the marketing, the design, the training our production artists on how to do their thing. But it's great because we stay in our lanes and we both uh, do the necessary work. That doesn't mean there's no overlap. Of course, there's some overlap and we act as a sounding board for each other, but it makes it easier when each person understands what they are directly responsible for. And uh, this, is, this is a concept that we actually got from premarital counseling and we applied to our business. So when we went to premarital counseling, yeah. Okay, so this is a great exercise. In, in, you know, we've been married 18 years, so this is stuck with us, but there's this, this worksheet that where you list out all of the different chores, just things that have to be done in life. Taking out the trash, cleaning the bathrooms, picking up the kids from school, um, doing the dishes, all, all, just a list of all the things you have to do in life. And then each, each person in the couple independently gets this list and they write the name next to the task, who is responsible for this? So I had to write down if <laughs> responsible for it and she would write down that she thought she I was responsible she was responsible and then we compare the lists and see how many differences there are and what similarities they are and then mm -hmm. if there are any differences like let's say I thought she was supposed to take out the trash and she thinks I'm supposed to take out the trash well we go ahead and work that out right then and there okay who is the person who is responsible for the trash going out to the street for the city to pick it up and so we decided that was me for that example so Ethan is next to that now, does that mean she never rolls out the trash? No, of course, she, she does sometimes. But I am the, the DRI, the directly responsible individual, Steve Jobs' term, for rolling the trash out to the side of the street. Now, I can hire somebody to do that. Um, I can do it myself. I can ask one of the kids to do it. Sometimes my wife may do it, but I'm the one who's owning that task. So if you think about life in, in that way, where there's some, there's one person who's responsible for every task. You do the same thing in business, then you know who, there's no ambiguity, and, and there's because mm -hmm. ambiguity leads to um, distress. When I'm sitting here thinking, "Oh, you were supposed to take out the trash," and she's thinking, "Oh, he was supposed to take out the trash," and nobody's saying anything, and we're mad at each <laughs> other. <laughs> It's like yeah. and getting irritated. Yes. Yeah, and then, and then it turns, and then if you don't communicate it, then the next day it's something else and it just compounds and you forgot what you were initially mad at the person about, you know, 10 months ago, but now they, they just irritate you and you want to divorce. So anyway, silly about the trash, but that, it, it, that has really, really helped us in our lives. So that is such an interesting example because I wonder what would happen if we had businesses where people did that example based on what my role is. Because I wonder yeah. how much role clarity there sometimes is in in business, but but Ethan, I I, I have to I have to ask you another question. I, I, it's fabulous that I mean everything around what you do comes down to apparel. 
And we've just spent 18 months in COVID where we've all been sitting and having meetings in our slippers. Mm. Why is apparel, why is brand, why is the way I look so important? Yeah, wow, that, what a great question. Okay, so this is why in, in August of this year, the richest person in the world was the, became the, the CEO of Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, LVMH, became the world's richest person. And if you think about it, Louis Vuitton, it's a luxury brand, right? Why would a luxury brand be flourishing when we're, the, we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic? doesn't make any sense. People, you, you, logic would tell you uh, that some pharmaceutical company or, or commodities or food, you know, would, would be thriving right now because those are core needs. But it's fashion, it's luxury. And why is that important? Because our core, our need for identity, for significance, like we all have that. We want to show the world who we are. That is why fashion and style are important. And it's different for everyone. I mean, like right now, I just have one, a, a plain shirt. It, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a blue shirt for it's mm -hmm. for functional purposes of this interview. But if I really want to show who I am, you know, having my logo on the shirt says says something. I'm proud of mm -hmm. uh, this company that I founded or I'm proud of where I work or I'm part of a team. Um, but if like someone who wears a Louis Vuitton logo, they're saying I am a person of status. I have wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can mm -hmm. I can. I can uh, have this $4,000 Louis Vuitton bag because of who I am. We want people to think a certain way about us. In our market, a lot of what we do is related to fraternities and sororities, which I know is, is more of an American thing, but it's a group that you are proud to be part of. You're showing off your affiliation, your colors, your letters, because every there, there are over 500 different fraternities and sororities but they each kind of have a different meaning, a different culture, different core values. And those core values bring out what you're all about. For example, my fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi, well, our motto is achievement in every field of human endeavor. And when I was in college, that, that just really resonated with me because it's about achieving in, in all of the things. And, and we'll talk about this more uh, later, I know, in our interview because I've developed a whole philosophy about what exactly that means for, for me and for everyone else, uh, but achieving in every field of human endeavor. So when I put on that jacket with my fraternity letters, that's it gives me a it gives you a feeling, right? When you put on clothes, right? Because you are you're embracing the meaning of the fashion. It has to follow function, and it has to you know it, it actually it's really all about the core function of what you're trying to do at the time. If I'm getting dressed to to work at my desk, I want to be comfortable. If I'm going to be on Zoom though, I need to make sure I'm also presentable to the audience I'm speaking with, at least from the, the chest up, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and don't stand up. <laughs> yeah, right. But if I'm going out to a function, not only do I need to put on pants, but I need to be I, I want to give off a certain image. So everything from, from head to toe, I'm going to want to make sure looks a certain way. From shining, making sure my shoes are shined the right way, if that's applicable to the event that I'm going to, making sure that my clothes are ironed. Um, so it's all about the function of what you're doing at the time. You mentioned something very interesting to me once. Um, you said something around the way that you dress and how it energizes or affects other people as well. So it's not just about your own energy, is it? Oh, not at all. Um, so when, in, in my methodology uh, of simple, which we can get into later, uh, but I, I believe there are six core areas of life and it, it spells an acronym simple. The P is for your physical presence. So this re relates to how you are, your physical space that you take up in the world. So not just what you're wearing. Yes, that's important. How you groom yourself. Also, how you take care of your body, what you're putting into your body, your, your fitness routine, because all of that, it doesn't just create an outward appearance, but it also affects your energy. So the 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 confidence that you exude when you feel good about yourself, you know, when when you've worked out and you don't have to be, you know, Mr. Olympia or Miss, you know, 
uh, high fashion Victoria's Secret model. It doesn't matter. But you know, when you feel good about yourself, you can tell like people just, have you ever been to like a, an event or a cocktail party? And sometimes it just flows. Like you just feel like you're working the room and everybody you talk to and the right things just come out off of your lips and um, it just goes really well and everything's in sync. Um, I'm sure you've experienced that in, at some point, but we've also experienced the the alternate of that where sometimes it just feels awkward. Like I, I've been to cocktail parties and stuff where it just feels like nobody wants to talk to me or everything I say, like I'm stumbling on my words, I'm getting tongue tied. I feel like, oh man, did I put on the wrong color socks and all this stuff is playing in my subconscious, right? And it, but it comes off in, in your, in those things you can't see. Like if you're, and if you're thinking about, oh, it's a piece of my hair sticking up or something like that, you know, that's detracting from your energy. So that's what I mean by physical presence affecting everyone you come in contact with. It, it, it affects your aura. Wonderful. So physical places, as you said, is just one of the elements of simple. Tell us about the rest. Yeah. So I have, I have this philosophy um, and I know we're on the performance cafe, right? So to me, well, now when most people think about performance, they think about just excelling in one area, like dominating, like, oh, I'm, I want to be a billionaire and I'm going to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Or I want to be an Olympic gold medalist. I'm going to go all in and focus on that or, or this or that. But I have this philosophy that you can have it all. And it's not about work-life balance. Um, I think work-life balance is a myth. But I think about it more of constant contextual ca calibration of six key areas of life. And those areas are your spirituality, your intellect, your money, your physical presence, your love and leadership, and your entertaining experiences. So it spells an acronym, simple, um, and it, it's also uh, it's a great word because it, it, once you embrace this mindset, life really does become more simple. We make it hard by mm -hmm. trying to focus on on one thing and then neglecting the other areas for too long. So think about it like this: think about the the wings of an airplane. Did you know that the wings of an airplane are not rigid? They are constantly in motion when your plane is flying. It, next time you're on a plane, look out there. There are a bunch of tiny little flaps, right? And little moving parts on the wing that are always like in the, in the movements might just be incremental, hard to even notice with the human eye, but they're always making these adjustments. I mean, there are literally, literally like over a hundred different parts on the wing of a plane. And so all of these micro adjustments to, mm -hmm. to adjust for, you know, rough air and turbulence to, to move the plane and get to avoid obstacles. Of course, they have to avoid other planes. And most of this is done by autopilot. In fact, 90% of the flight is on autopilot. The pilot really just uh, it handles like takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. So what's cool about that, what taught me about that is if you think of those six areas that I mentioned, it's like the wings of your plane. Well, you just mm -hmm. calibrate a little bit here and there depending on the circumstances of what's going on in your life at that very moment. And that can get down to the day by day. So take an assessment of your day today. Well, how are you doing in each of those areas? How, how am I feeling? And when I talk about spirituality, a lot of some, for some people that that's kind of a turnoff because they think of religion mm -hmm. or this mystical mm -hmm. stuff. Right. But uh, so sometimes when I that S, um, I mm -hmm. want you to think of it as subconscious restructuring. Because it's really what spirituality is actually more scientific than we realize. We just don't know how the science works yet. Because if you think about, like, for example, my cell phone, right? Mm -hmm. what, what makes this work? I can't see the invisible forces that go to the cell phone tower and to the satellite or whatever, whatever. I don't care how it works. I just want it to work. And it better work or I'm going to be calling the phone company or going to the Apple store, right, to complain. Why do I trust those invisible forces that I don't understand? There are so many invisible forces in this world that we don't yet understand. There's more invisible things than there are visible things, if you think about it. So the, the key is to tap into those invisible things. And I, I have a method for doing that. And I believe that that is actually the structure of um, the, the foundation of improving all the areas of your life is having a strong foundation 
in rewiring and restructuring your subconscious daily. You want me to get into that? Well, you see, we shouldn't because we don't have time, but I have a question. Of course, I always have a question. Have you noticed? This is me. <laughs> um, when you say spiritual, you're quite right. One thinks religion or even spirituality. But now you're talking about rewiring my subconscious. Where do the two come together? Yeah. In yeah. Uh -huh. Great question. So in, in religion... Uh, most religions have some form of prayer or maybe meditation or incantations. It's all really connected to the same thing. What we are doing is we're being still and we are allowing our brain to get in tune with the universe. I mean, everything, every thought, think of it like this. A thought is actually a thing. When you have a thought in your brain, there's actually an electrical spark, like, like a, like things happen in your brain, like a, like an actual, like electrons fire off in your, in your, I mean, I'm sorry, neurons fire off in your brain. So now it actually exists in this world as matter, as a neuron that fired off in your brain. Hmm. The next, and remember Einstein said, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. Well, the next form that your thought takes is in the form of a word. You speak out the thought that you had. Now it exists in the world as sound waves. And then the next thing is you you take action. Thoughts become actions. I mean, thoughts become words. Words become actions. Now you're doing something. Maybe you start building that invention, invention that was a thought in your brain. Then you spoke it. Mm -hmm. and you start doing it. So this is how things come to be. Everything comes in the world into the world as a thought. So when you sit down and you be still in the morning and you you meditate, whatever you want to practice, it can be transcendental meditation. Uh, that's what I practice. Um, also prayer, but you are you are slowing down. You're not letting external forces or email dings and this and that push around your, your mental space, but you are wiring your subconscious for what you appreciate and for what you want in life. And then your subconscious, that's your autopilot. It is what guides you. Your subconscious actually think about like when you go drive, you drive from here to the office. You don't even think about it because it's part of your subconscious now. You can do you can be thinking about a million other things, having phone conversations, doing whatever, um, because you've driven so much that it's become habit and become second nature. Sometimes you don't even remember the drive from your office to home. You just, oh, I'm just here. So that if you if you constantly program your subconscious every day for the things that you want in life, then they'll just start to happen. OK, sir. I'll buy Except, what do we do with failure? Failure. So, I mean, tell me more about failure. To me. So, if I can, if I can, let, I have a vision board. So, let's say I take my vision board and I meditate with my vision board. You're saying I'm attracting it to me, which is fine. I, mm -hmm. I understand that concept. But what do I do then when I fail? Because doesn't failure sort of put a spoke in the wheel of all of this? Uh, okay, so wonderful question. Um, the thing to remember this is, you know, failure isn't permanent. I think it was Churchill who said, um, no, success is never permanent and failure isn't fatal. So neither success or failure are permanent. If you feel like you failed, you just haven't gotten there yet. Or... Maybe you did fail at something that you wanted to do and you learned a lesson from it. So that's still not a failure because um, I believe that in life, I either win or I learn. If I lose something, there's a valuable lesson that I learned there. And even like, for example, I remember going through a lawsuit in my business one time due to like a, a, a silly loophole in a contract. We ended up in this long dispute and these people try to take us to the cleaners. Like I almost thought I was going to have to file bankruptcy. It was a very, very scary time. I was able to get through it. And I learned a lot in that process. In that eight month process, hired a great attorney. We countersued and ended up settling. But I could have gotten a law degree. I spent a lot of money <laughs> going through that process. <laughs> so, and after I went through, I, like I studied so much because, that, you know, you have great lawyers, but 
at, at the end of the day, if you ever go through something like that, you need to be knowledgeable yourself because it's your bank account. It's, it's your fund. So I dove in and I learned a ton about contract law that I didn't know before. And at the end of the day, with legal fees and everything, I probably ended up spending about three hundred thousand uh, dollars just to settle this thing. Such a nuisance. Mm-hmm. But I said, you know what? That was equivalent to like I-, I paid tuition in life. Not only did I get my law degree just now um, through the hard knocks of life, but I also learned a ton of things about business. And it actually has helped my business now going through that experience. And I- I- while I hated it at the time, I'm thankful that it happened now. So failures in life um, are, are really opportunities to enhance you. I believe that the universe is conspiring for you at all times. Even when it seems like things are bad, they are actually working for your good. I love that. So, Ethan, I mean, we are both entrepreneurs. I, I get it when we make mistakes. At least we make it on our own bank balance. How do I, as a manager in a business deal with it or in my own business deal with it when someone else makes the mistake that costs me all those school fees as you as you put it once oh yeah it, uh, it's so tough like when, when you have an employee or a team member who makes a mistake and it and it impacts the company and it causes you to lose money or lose cost customers or goodwill i've totally been there i think every, every part of delegation you have to be okay with the fact that somebody is going to make a mistake that is going to impact you. It's it's one of the the uh, it's it's the rub. It's it's one of the parts of being a leader. And mm-hmm. uh, business. Well, first of all, there's still always a learning lesson in there. There's a learning lesson in there for the person who made the mistake. There's a learning lesson for you as the leader, and there's a learning lesson for everyone on the team. So use it as an opportunity to teach and to train whatever that mistake was form a system around it, put it in your training manuals so that you don't encounter that same mistake again. Make make changes to systems in company wide so that that mistake can be avoided. So now you have reinforced your company because of the mistake. And even though you may have lost some money temporarily, well, you can use it to build and fortify your company so that you don't, that never happens again. And you can actually leverage it to possibly Add another income income stream to your business, um, but think of think of mistakes um, like armor, like mm-hmm. like a callus, like if you it, or a scab, like if you cut your skin, it scabs up and gets hard. So now it's hardened, and that area won't get won't get as hurt again because it's stronger actually than the area that hasn't been cut. So your business actually be, can become stronger from mistakes that have happened. As long as you take them, apply the learning lessons, and use that to reinforce your business. 